chapter number one this morning. Thank you all so much. And um, as you're turning in your copy of God's Word, let me just mention to you, tonight at 5 o'clock, 5 o'clock this evening, we're having church-wide prayer meeting and outreach, and we'll meet out in the gymnasium. And what we'd like to do during this time is going to be very simple. First of all, we want you to bring names of folks that we want to pray for together that the Lord would save them. Maybe you've got someone who's away from the Lord or someone who needs to be saved. But I'd like you to be thinking this afternoon about someone that we can pray for together throughout this new year as a church and see God answer prayer on their behalf. And so I want you to do that this afternoon. Come and we'll pray together for these folks. And then we'll also be writing, sending the gospel out into Yadkin County. Uh, All we'll be doing is putting a gospel track in a card, writing a short note, letting those folks know that we're praying for them, and we will pray for them, and then just share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Uh, One of our members, you sometimes wonder, does something like that have any effect, or does it have any uh, bearing on folks? One of our members was in a business this week, and uh, they were walking by the office, I believe, of the person who was over the whole business, as best I understood the story. And uh, they were walking by the office, and it caught their eye because they saw one of our gospel tracks tacked up on their board. And so they stepped to the office of that person and said, Excuse me, I, I don't mean to bother you, but uh, is that from Northwood Baptist Church? And they said, uh, Yeah, it is. He said, Okay, have you ever been to Northwood before? I don't remember seeing you. And they said, No, I've never been to your church, but I got this in the mail several months ago, and I just love that verse, and so I put it up on my board. And uh, those dear folks don't go to church anywhere right now, so they've been invited here. And who knows what God might do with one of those gospel tracks just lay in a drawer somewhere, tacked on a board somewhere, but when the time is right, God's going to bring it to mind, and He's going to save souls through it. So I'm excited about that. So don't miss that. At 5 o'clock today, we'll be meeting out in the gym. Uh, If you're uncomfortable, you can head over to the old sanctuary. Of course, anyone in the old sanctuary, wear a mask for the entirety there. But we'll also be praying together over there and uh, getting some cards out there. So just come. There's a place for you to serve. And God is doing a work even in these days. It's good to see visitors with us today. We're glad that you're here. And uh, we're grateful to the Lord for your being with us. Good to see some of our folks back here for the first time in a long time. Some have had health difficulties and other things, but we're glad that you're here today. Now, what I have in front of me right here is a precious and a dear friend because number one, it has the time on it. That's a friend to y'all, but number two, it has the temperature. How many of y'all are hot this morning? I am hot up here. So here's what we're going to do. Will you cut it down to 69? Uh, Get it right there. That'll be a blessing. And then we're going to get into the Word of God. Now I've got some ladies who are sitting out there saying, Preacher, I'm already about to freeze to death. Don't worry. It's going to be all right. Luke chapter number 1. And I want to preach today. We're going to look at 45 verses. But I can encourage you this way. Uh, We had in the old sanctuary the opportunity to preach already once this morning. These same verses. And we finished there, uh, I believe, in about 35 minutes. So it is possible. And so that doesn't mean you get to sit there and look at your clock. And when we get to 35, say, preacher, you're done. It's over. Uh, But 35 minutes is all it took over there. So we're going to hurry and we're going to hear from the Lord this morning. Let's read together. Luke chapter number one. I love to preach through the Bible verse by verse. Just hear a little, there a little, and see what the Lord has to say to us. We won't look at every verse this morning just because of time constraints. But to get the fullness of the story, we do need to look at least at these first 45 verses here in the book of Luke chapter number 1. So let's read together Luke 1 and verse 5 where the word of God says this. There were then the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. This is verse number 5 of course. And his wife was one of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But verse number 7 says this, and this is a serious note and a sad note in this story. It says, They had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. Let's pray together, and I want to preach today on this subject. Big news 
and the best news. Heavenly Father, you've already given us a good morning. We thank you for the visitors who are with us, the folks who are watching online, sharing in the service. I pray that you would bless them through your word today. I pray as I am your messenger, God, I'm nothing special. I'm nothing noble in and of myself. I don't have the ability to communicate your word to your people. So God, I'm going to ask for your help today. All I am is a messenger boy, just bringing the message that comes from you. And so I pray that you'll help me, Lord, to bring the message clearly. Help me to bring the message with power today. And if there's someone sitting here today who's got questions, Someone who doesn't really believe at all, but they're here. We're glad that they're here. And I pray that today you would speak to their heart, you would minister to their heart, and you would make it real to them today that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. I ask that you save someone today. Lord, save several. No doubt there are several here online who are listening and who don't know Jesus. And we're grateful for them. And we ask that you would save them by your grace today. And then as we're here knowing you, I pray that we'll be drawn closer to you. I pray we'll be more in all of you, more in love with you when we leave this place than we were when we came in today. Help us now. Lord, don't let me say or do anything that would hinder this service. Forgive me of any sin that would block and would hinder your work. Help us to be willing vessels obedient to your will today. Do your perfect will. Let your word do its work. I ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Now I'm preaching today on this subject, big news and the best news. You say, well, what's the big news in this chapter? Well, let's look just for a moment at the context, and I believe you'll see quickly what the big news is. First of all, the Bible opens up, and you remember who's writing here. It's a man by the name of Luke. It's a man who's already told us, I want to give you the exact details. And what we have before us is exactly what happened. This isn't a myth. This isn't a fable. This isn't an allegory. This is exactly what took place. And he says, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Now, I want you to understand this. and I want you to realize this. The Bible is a historical book. Now, you look at books of other religions. You look at books of other faiths. And what you'll find is that they are books that are apart from history. They're books that really don't want to deal with the history. Because the history would misprove and disprove their stories. But the Bible and the writers in Scripture are so careful that we know the details. They say, we want you to know exactly when this took place. Now, that's important for two reasons. Number one, it gives us the ability as modern readers to look back in the Word of God and say, okay, this took place during the days of Herod. Well, let's look in history. Was there ever a man by the name of Herod? Was there ever a ruler by the name of Herod? And see God's word confirmed again and again. But it did something else. For those people who received this letter originally, it did this. When he said this happened during the days of Herod, the king of Judea, they could say, okay, that was this year to this year. Well, I know somebody who was living during that time. I know someone who was around during that time, so I'm going to go ask them, is what this man is saying correct? Is what he's saying true? Because the writers of Scripture, and more than that, the Holy Ghost of God wants you to know and wants me to know the certainty of the things that we've believed. Now here's what I'm glad about this morning. We have a certain faith. We have a faith that we can depend on. But more than our faith, more than what we believe, let me say this to you. We have God's Word, and God cannot tell a lie. And so he says, in the days of the king Herod, he was king over Judea, he was a wicked man, he was a vile man, he was a cruel man, during his days of ruling over this region, during his days as being the executive of Rome in this part of the world, during his days of wickedness and harshness and cruelness, there was a man by the name of Zacharias. Now, Zacharias was just an ordinary man. He was a priest. He was a part of the family of Aaron. He came from the family of the priest. But he was just an ordinary man. He was no man of great esteem. In fact, the priest, when you look at it, there would have been literally hundreds, possibly even thousands of priests alive at this time. And it was so much and there were so many priests that in David's day, he said, we've got to get this thing organized. We've got to get this together. We've got to make sure that the right people are serving at the right place at the right time. So he said, we're going to make out companies. And you're going to serve in the company of priests of the family that you come from. It's almost like in our day, you've got the different firehouses. You've got the different companies. You've got the Yadkinville company. You've you've got the Shoals company. You've got all these different companies and these different firehouses. And David said, when it comes time for your company, 
when it comes time for your family, you'll go and serve. But I want you to understand this. Zacharias was just one among hundreds. He was just one among thousands. But the Bible says this about him. He was a man who lived righteously before the Lord. Now he had a wife by the name of Elizabeth. She too was just one among many. One among the many people in the nation of Israel. She was no one who had a great name. She was no one who if she walked into the room, you would say, oh my soul, that's Elizabeth. I've wanted to see her my whole life. She was just a common woman, an ordinary woman. But here's what we know about her. She lived righteously before the Lord. But even as she lived righteously before the Lord, she had one desire. He had one desire, and that desire hadn't come to pass. You say, what was that desire? Well, the desire of most every woman is simply this, that one day God would give them the privilege of being a mother. In our day, it is heartbreaking. It is sad. It it, it is difficult when you desire to have a child and God doesn't give you a child for whatever reason. And that's where Elizabeth found herself. She wanted a baby so bad she could taste it. She wanted a baby so bad. Every time she saw someone walking by with a child in her arms under her breast, she'd say, God, have you forgotten about me? God, have you passed over me? God, do you you remember me? Do you remember my husband? We're trying to do what pleases you. God, would you please let me have a baby? But there was one problem. Elizabeth, by this point in the story, was an old woman. Now, I'm going to say something here, and I want to couch it before I say it. I want to be careful how I say this. When I worked at Chick-fil-A, I always trained our people. I don't know if this was the company policy or not, but here's how I would train our people. Company policy is that if they're 65 years or older, they get a free cup of coffee. You get your senior coffee if you're 65 years or older. But here's how I train our people. I'd say, listen, if they don't ask for a senior cup of coffee, you don't give them a senior cup of coffee. Because you don't want to be the one who tells them that they are a senior now. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so if they don't ask for it, you don't give it to them. Even if they look like Methuselah, you don't give them that cup of coffee unless they ask for it. And listen, if they come in here and they look like they're 15 years old and they ask for a senior cup of coffee, you just go ahead and give it to them because I'm not going to be the one that gets into telling anybody that they're old. Somebody say amen right there. That being said, every time I've read this in the Bible where it says that that she was well stricken in years, I just took that to mean she was an older woman. And no doubt that is what it means. When it says that Zacharias was an old man, I, I, I took that to mean he's an old man. But it uses a very specific phrase, and that phrase is this. They were both, in verse 7, now well stricken in years. You know what that means? It means they were old people. Now you say, well, what's an old person? Again, I'm not saying this about anyone sitting in this room today, all right? Brother Charlie, I'm not saying about this, you about this for a moment, okay? But listen to me. Here's what they consider to be an old person in the Hebrew culture. Now you've got to remember, people died younger back then, all right? Y'all are going to live to be 100, every one of you, so it's okay. But here's what they considered to be the commencement of old age, 65 years old. So without being disrespectful, if you saw someone and they were 65 years old, you could say... That's an old person. Kids, husbands, let me give you some advice. If you see somebody today who's 65 years or older, don't walk up to them and say, well, you're starting to be old, aren't you? Don't do that, okay? But in this day, old age commenced at 65 years old. When you reach 70 years of old, they could begin to refer to you as hoary-headed. They could begin to say, now there's a hoary-headed man. He's been around a long time. But when you reached 80 years old or older... Do you hear what I just said? 80 or above, that's when you could be considered well stricken in years. Now, I don't know today if you're a young person, an old person, well stricken in years, but here's what I'm telling you. There is a woman walking around who's at least 80 years old. Her husband is at least 80 years old, according to the Bible. And she desires to have a baby. She wants to have a baby from God. She wants to have a child, but she's 80 years old. That time has passed in her life. She's not going to have a child. And in fact, Zacharias is a priest. And most likely one time in your life, if you were a priest, you would get to serve at the holy place. If it was more than that in your life, it was some kind of miracle. God definitely wanted it to happen because you've got to remember, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of priests. So when your company served, even in your family, even in your company, there were hundreds of priests. 
And you only got to serve there maybe one time a year. And so now you might get to serve there. You say, well, how did they choose who would go in? Well, it wasn't just that a priest said, hey, I want to go serve in the holy place. That's not how it happened. Everyone wanted to serve in the holy place. Everyone wanted to do this. So here's how they chose. They drew lots. And out of thousands of priests... And then out of hundreds of priests, you may have your lot drawn. And if God so chose that you were the one to go in, that was probably the only time you'd go in in your whole life. Now you've got this 80-year-old man. He's been serving as a priest for years and years. He's at least 80 years old. And on this particular day, he draws the lot. And it's his lot, it's his job, it's his commitment to go in in verse number 8. That while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course and his company... According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went in to the temple of the Lord. Once in a lifetime opportunity to go in and pray before the Lord, to offer incense on the altar. And the verse says in verse 10, And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Now let's pause right there. Get the picture in your mind. Once in a lifetime opportunity. Zacharias walks into the holy place. He comes into the holy place. And here's what his job was. He was to take this incense and put it on the hot burning coals of fire. And that incense was to represent prayers going up to God. Prayers ascending to heaven. And the Bible tells us that that incense, that sweet smelling odor, was a sweet smell in the nostrils of God. So here's what Zacharias was commanded to do. You go into the holy place. Not the holiest of all, but you go into the holy place. And when you go in there, you go in respectfully. You go in carefully. You go in mindfully. You go in reverently. And you will go in, you will put this incense upon the holy place. And that sweet smelling savor will go up before God. And as you're there, and as the sweet smelling savor is going up, and as that aroma is filling your nostrils, here's what you do, Zacharias. Here's what you do, priest. You go in and realize that as you stand there at this altar of incense, and as the incense is going up before God, that just on the other side of that curtain, Just on the other side of that veil that separates you, just on the other side of the wall, if you will, is the very manifest presence of God on earth. God's in there, Zacharias. So when you go in, you go in reverently and you place the incense on the altar and that sweet-smelling savor enters into the nostrils of God. And while you're there, pray for the people. Pray that God would forgive the sins of the people. Pray that God would protect the nation. Pray that God would bless the people. You go in and you pray on behalf of the people. There's some very definite things that you're to pray about there, Zacharias. So no doubt now, Zacharias, a righteous man, a good man, a man who loves God, has a once in a lifetime opportunity. He sprinkles the incense on the altar. He smells that sweet savor. It enters into the nostrils of God. It represents the prayers of the people. And then he's supposed to pray, Dear God, forgive the sins of your people. Dear God, bless your nation. Dear God, would you protect our nation. Dear God, would you do these things according to your will. But I just have to believe that while Zacharias is standing there, once in a lifetime opportunity, he knows that just on the other side of that veil, just on the other side of that curtain, a place into which he cannot enter is the presence of a thrice holy God that God has manifested himself. And he said, Lord, I know you told me to come in here and sprinkle incense on the altar. Lord, I know you told me to pray for the people, and I have. And Lord, I know you told me to pray for the forgiveness of their sins, and I have. And Lord, I know you told me to pray for the blessing on this nation, and I have. But Lord... You hadn't told me to do this, but this is a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I've got a a once-in-a-lifetime audience. I know that your presence is just on the other side of that curtain. And God, you haven't told me to do this, but dear God, would you please? I know we're 80 years old. God, I know I'm already an old man, well-stricken in years. I know my wife is a woman, well-stricken in years. Childbearing years are far behind us, but God, I've prayed for the nation. I've prayed for forgiveness. I've prayed for blessing. God, would you let us have a child? God, would you let me have a baby? Even as an old man, would you give to me a child? And then the Bible says immediately, as he's praying before the Lord, as he's offering up incense, he's done everything he's supposed to do except for maybe one thing. 
He's prayed a personal prayer and he wasn't commanded to do that. And maybe he's even wondering as he's doing it, should I even do this? Am I tempting God to ask him for something that's impossible? Am I tempting God when I ask for something that there's no physical way can take place? Should I even be praying this? And then all of a sudden, there is an angel of the Lord standing in the room with him. You know what his reaction was? I believe his reaction, according to God's word, is exactly what your reaction would have been and my reaction. Look at what the angel said. Fear not. Zacharias, you are scared to death. Your knees are shaking. You're trembling. You think you've done something wrong. and You think you've done something. And so that's why I showed up and I'm here to judge you. He says, Zacharias, fear not. For thy prayer is heard. I believe that's the prayer that they had prayed for years. God, give us a son. I believe it was the prayer that he had just prayed there in the presence of God. God, give us a son. Thy prayer is heard, verse 13. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness. And many shall rejoice at his birth. But then the Bible tells us that Zechariah looks at the angel in verse number 18 and says, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man. And my wife is well stricken in years. Get the picture. Dear God, bless the people. Dear God, forgive the sins of the people. Dear God, protect our nation. And dear God, would you please let us have a baby. An angel appears. He's scared to death. The angel says, your prayer's answered. You're going to have a baby. And then he looks at him and says, and how is this going to be? How's this going to happen? Don't you know that I'm an old man? Don't you know that my wife is well stricken in years? She's at least 80 years old. I'm at least 80 years old. How in the world is this going to happen? I don't believe it. How many times have we prayed and we've asked God and we've said, Dear God, would you do it? Dear God, this is impossible with man. But God, I know you can do it. And then he answers our prayer and we said, Are you serious? But Zachariah says, How's this going to be? I need a sign. I need you to show me something. She's an old woman. I'm an old man. It doesn't work this way. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and I am sent to speak unto thee and to show these glad tidings. You want a sign, Zacharias? You want a sign that God's heard your prayer? You want a sign that God has answered your prayer? Here I am. I'm an angel. I've been standing in the presence of God. You know I'm an angel. It's clear I'm an angel. You were scared to death. You were a mumbling fool just a moment ago. And now you're questioning whether I know what God has said about this? Listen here, Zacharias. Because you didn't believe, verse number 20, thou shalt be, what's the word? Dumb. And not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. The people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days were accomplished of his ministration, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach. Among men. Get the picture. An 80 year old man shows up at home. He's not able to speak. He's not able to form words. And he motions. And and he motions to Elizabeth. And she finally gets him a piece of paper. and, And he draws out on this piece of paper. We're going to have a baby. And the Bible says she conceived. And for five months she hid herself. She knows without a doubt that this was God's word. 80 year old woman having a baby. But she remembers all those times as she'd be walking through town and she says, the Lord's taken away my reproach. She remembers all those times that she'd be walking through town and they'd whisper one to another, you know why she doesn't have a baby, don't you? God knows something about her that we don't know. God knows there's something wrong with that woman. There's some sin that's hidden in her life or Zacharias' life. And the reason God hasn't allowed them to have a child is because of some hidden and some secret sin. And They would mock her. They would malign her. May I say this to you? If God does not allow you to have a child, If God does not allow you to have a baby, that is no indication of His judgment on you. That is an indication that it is His will for you, your life. Now you say, can I still have a baby? I'll say this, don't keep praying. 
Zacharias didn't keep praying as an 80 year old man. He kept praying. He kept believing God. He kept saying, God, would you do it? God, would you send it? I'm reminded of a young man, and I probably shouldn't say this, probably shouldn't tell this story, but I like this story. There was a preacher one time that told this true story. There was a lady who every night before she would go to bed, she was a lady who had never married. You know the story and you're already saying, don't do it, don't do it, but I am. There was this older lady who had never married and she prayed every night. She said, God, I want you to send me a husband. And she got more and more serious about it. So one day she decided and she started laying a pair of men's slacks over the end of her bed every night. And her prayer was this, here's my prayer, Lord, if you can. To fill those trousers, please send a man. God let that woman marry. Preacher told that story in his church one day, and, and the mom hadn't been there that day, and dad and son were at church. And the mom came to the preacher a few weeks ago, or a few weeks later, and said, uh, Pastor, i got to talk to you. I'm concerned about my teenage son. What's going on? He's gotten really serious about his prayer life. I hear him every night in his room. He's praying and he's getting serious with God. But preacher, why is there a woman's bathing suit at the end of his bed? I shouldn't have told that. Y'all pray for me. <clears throat> Y'all pray for me. But man, they're praying this prayer. They're asking God, God, send us a child. But Elizabeth said, I've heard their wagging tongues for the last 60 years. I've heard them say there's something wrong with me. So she says, Zacharias, I'm just going to hide myself away for the next five months. And when I show up after five months and it's evident and it's obvious that God has given me a child, my reproach will be taken away and it'll be obvious that God has done it. Now let's fast forward another scene. The Bible says in verse 26, the same angel in the sixth month, the sixth month of what? Of Elizabeth's pregnancy. The angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Paul's time out. We're going to preach on this specifically next Sunday morning. But let me give you a quick lesson in language. When the Bible says that Mary was a virgin, do you know what it means? She was a virgin. In fact, she says just a few verses later, Lord, I believe you. I'm going to take you at your word. But how can this be? I've never known a man. I've never been with a man. But Mary, a young woman, a virgin, she's a spouse to Joseph. She's already promised to marry this man by the name of Joseph. And an angel shows up and says, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. In verse number 30, the angel says, You have found favor with God. In verse number 31, the angel says, You'll bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then verse 34, Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? You see, Mary was already espoused to Joseph. In that day when you were, when you were espoused to someone, it's almost the equivalent in our day of being engaged. But it was even more serious because in that day, you would first, there was this first stage of your, of your looking for a mate. You might court someone, you might have someone assigned to you by your parents, but somewhere along in your courtship, somewhere along in it, you'd look at each other and you would say, I want to marry you. And she'd look back at you and say, and I want to marry you. And so then you would come before your parents, you might come before some religious leaders, you might come before some town leaders, but you would literally sign a contract that said, we are espoused one to another. Now you might have to give a dowry, you, you might have to go through some legal hoops to get there, but at that moment in the eyes of that community you were just as good as married but once you were a spouse the husband the man would go and he would prepare a place for the woman to come and to live with him pause and listen to this aren't you glad that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us aren't you glad that he's gone to the father's house and made a place where we can dwell with him back on subject listen you're a spouse, you're promised to one another, you're just as good as married in the eyes of the community. You're just as good as married in the eyes of each other. You've signed the contract, you've given your word. But there was a waiting period before you could come together. Number one, so the man could prepare a place for the woman to live with him. But number two, there was one little detail. They had to make sure that this woman was pure. Had to make sure this woman was what she claimed to be. Had to make sure that this woman had never been with another man. 
And so they had to wait a little while just in case she was with child and it would begin showing. And if you found that she was with child in the Old Testament, we're told that you could take that woman because she had lied to you. You could take that woman because she had deceived you, dishonored God and dishonored her city. You could take her and take her life from her because of the sin that she had committed. You could stone her to death. But you also had this option. You could put her away privately. You could give her a writ of divorcement. You could put her away privately before you were ever come together. Before you ever said your vows. Before you ever consummated your marriage. You could put her away privately because you still love that woman. She betrayed you. She broke your heart. But you still loved her. So you could put her away privately and quietly and not embarrass her. Mary has all this in her mind when an angel shows up and says, Mary, blessed art thou among women. You're highly favored among women. You're chosen by God. You found favor with God. You're going to have a son and his name will be called Jesus. But here's what I love about Mary. While all these things are going through her mind, I could be stoned to death for this. I could have my life ended. Joseph is going to be crushed. Joseph is going to be destroyed. While all these things are in her mind, here's what she says to the angel. How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She wasn't doubting the message. She was just saying, how's it going to work? She's saying, listen, I I know I'm just a young and a teenage girl, but I know how children come into the world. And, and I've never been with a man. I'm a spouse to Joseph. I'm engaged to him. I'm promised to him. I'm as good as married to him. I'm just waiting for him to prepare a place for me. I'm just waiting for this waiting period to be over. And I'm going to marry him. But I've never been with a man. How is this going to work? This is going to wreck and this is going to ruin my name. How's all this going to work, angel? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and shall overpower thee overshadow thee rather he shall overshadow thee and therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God and behold Mary by the way I know you've got questions I know you've got doubts I know you've got fears and I I see that you believe me I see that you trust me but you still have questions may I say this to you today you remember the man who said I believe help thou mine unbelief this book was given to help our unbelief To help us to see God and to know God and to understand God. But the angel says, listen Mary, you found favor with God. You've been graced of God. You've been endued with grace. You've been blessed with grace. You've found favor. But Mary, earlier in the chapter we see Zechariah say, give me a sign. And the angel says, you're not getting any sign. You're going to be shut up until this baby is born. Mary doesn't ask for a sign and the angel gives her one. Why? Because she just believed God. And said in verse 36, Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth. He could have named any cousin that she had. But he says, little teenage girl, you're going to have a baby without ever having been with a man. And by the way, you want to sign, you want to see that it's true, your cousin. Your cousin is with child. And maybe Mary's mind went down through the Rolodex of all the cousins. She thought, well, they've just got married and, and she's about due for another child. Maybe it's this one and maybe that one. And the angel says, no, 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 Mary. Behold thy cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth? My 80-year-old cousin? Yeah, Elizabeth. Hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And in verse 38, Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. She said, I'm your servant. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary, you're going to have a baby. You're going to have a baby without ever knowing a man. You're going to have a baby and his name is going to be Jesus. He's the Son of God. But Mary, I can see that you still have questions. I see you believe me, but I see you still have your fears and you still have your worries. So Mary, I want you to go up to the hill country. I want you to go to the home of Zacharias the priest. And I want you to go to the home of Elizabeth. And I want you to go and see your 80-year-old cousin. And when you step to the door of your 80-year-old cousin, and you knock on the door, and the door opens, you're going to find a woman who is six months with child. And she's going to be standing there. And it's going to be obvious. It's going to be apparent that God can do anything. 
And the Bible says that when she came and Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary in verse 41, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in the womb, sounded in my ears rather, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed, that word blessed there means favored. Blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And then we see Mary begin singing and rejoicing in the Lord. Here's the message this morning. Here's the message. Big news. Can you imagine how it spread all over the countryside? There's an 80-year-old woman over there. And I don't know what's going on. Maybe she's got a tumor growing inside of her. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's taking place. I had a great aunt by the name of Hazel. She's gone on to be with the Lord. After her husband passed away, and my family, they'll hear this and they know the story's true. After her husband passed away, she was lonely there at home. And, of course, she wanted something to do. And so she had all, all through their years together, they had ate some of the nastiest stuff you would ever believe. One of their favorite meals to have. How many of you know what mush is? You know what mush is? God bless you for not knowing what it is. I've had to eat that stuff, and it's terrible. But Aunt Hazel, they'd have mush. They'd have things just around the house. And Aunt Hazel was a wonderful woman, but she was not a great cook. And I'm just telling you the truth. She's in heaven, so I hope she doesn't hear this because she'll have something to say about it. But she was not a good cook. But Uncle Dale had, had soldiered through all those years. But when he passed away, she realized, I don't have anyone to cook for anymore, and I'm not really that good of a cook anyway, and I'm tired of eating mush. And Aunt Hazel had always been a very slender, very trim woman. But she discovered in her 80s, Burger King. And she started going to Burger King every single day, and she would have Whoppers. And she would take those Whoppers. Every day she'd have multiple Whoppers, and and she would eat her Whoppers, and she would take the papers, clean them off. She would clean the papers off, save the papers, and use them as placemats when we went over to her house. That's the absolute truth. But what I'm getting ready to tell you, I promise you, is the truth with my hand up to God. Aunt Hazel had always been, and it's Aunt Hazel, I know, but Aunt Hazel had always been a very slender, very trim woman, and she was even then. But she started getting a pooch. And she was convinced and went to the doctor and said, Doctor, I've got a tumor inside of me. You've got to do something about this. You know what it was? It was those whoppers. <laughs> now, now, that was hilarious, but, but listen to this. There's an 80-something-year-old woman who's walking around, and everybody has to say, there's no way it can be. But Elizabeth looks like she's pregnant. And Zacharias, he got so shocked by it, he hadn't been able to say anything for six months. And we can't believe it, we can't understand it, but it looks like she's pregnant. Can you imagine the big news that went all over that community? What about this big news? There's a girl over here, she's never been with a man, she says. And yet she's getting ready to have a baby. It's Elizabeth's cousin. She's come up to the hill country and she's living with Elizabeth. She's been here for three months and she hasn't even told her prospective groom yet, but she's going to have to get back down the road soon. And maybe that's why she came up here so that she could get a priest to write down that no, what she's saying really is true. She hasn't been with a man so that when she comes into the city and maybe she's starting to show her bump, they don't kill her before she can ever explain things to Joseph. Maybe that's why she's up here. But can you imagine the big news that goes all over that community? That's big news. May I say this to you though? It's not impossible with God. You say 80 year old women don't have babies. They do if God decrees it. You say a virgin can't have a baby. She can if God wills it. Because the Bible tells us this. For with God nothing shall be impossible. If he is able to scoop out of the dust of the earth and form man and breathe into his life the breath of or breathe into him the breath of life, he's able to bring life out of nothing. If the God who formed every person sitting in this room today in your mother's womb while you were hidden, if He who formed your genetic code, if He who determined the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, your height, if the one who determined all those things while you were yet hidden in your mother decrees that an 80-year-old woman has a baby, it's going to happen. And if He decrees that a virgin will bring forth His Son into the world, it will happen. Because the big news is there's an 80 
60-year-old woman who's having a baby. The big news is there's a virgin girl who's having a baby. But the best news is this, and it's found in verse number 37. I want you to read it aloud with me. Have you found it? If you found it, say amen. Verse 37, let's read this aloud together. Here's the best news of all. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Let's read it one more time. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. There was an old man whose name was Zacharias. His name meant Jehovah remembers. He was married to a woman by the name of Elizabeth. And her name meant my God is an oath. If we could put their two names in low, simple language, it would be something like this. God remembers and God keeps His promises. But we're 80 years old. He's forgotten us. We're 80 years old. Promise isn't going to be true for us. We're 80 years old. We're forgotten. No, with God, nothing shall be impossible. May I say to you today, you may feel like God has forgotten you. Go look at a virgin girl holding a baby in her arms and saying, the Lord hath done great things for me. You say, I think the Lord's forgotten me. I I don't believe the Lord's going to keep His promises to me. Go look at an 80-year-old woman who's setting up a nursery, who's setting up a home because God keeps His promises and God has not forgotten you. You say, I'm facing a situation and I'll just be honest, preacher. I've prayed and I've prayed and the more I've prayed, the worse it's gotten. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Preacher, I've got things that I've been believing God for for years and it's going the wrong direction and and the day of that prayer being answered is long gone. There's no hope. My child has walked away from the Lord and they're not coming back. I've been praying for them for years and they're not going to get saved. I've got this disease and it can never be healed. May I say this to you? God remembers and God keeps His promises and God is able to do the impossible. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. You're looking at a situation that is insurmountable in your own strength. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. There's an 80-year-old woman. With God, nothing shall be impossible. There's a virgin girl who's giving birth to a child and laying him in swaddling clothes and wrapping him in this. And this is just impossible. No, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Next time you're wondering, God, can you do it? Next time you're standing there as Zacharias and saying, God, should I even pray about this? God, is it even right for me to ask you to do the impossible? Look and remember, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Big news. There's two ladies going to have a baby. Best news. With God, nothing shall be impossible. The God who made man can remake man. The God who saw man in his infancy there in the Garden of Eden. The man who saw you in your mother's womb. The God who created you. The God who saw when you told your first lie. The God who saw when you told your first lie and stole your first item. The God who saw the sins you have committed is the same God who said, I love you. I've not forgotten you. I have grace for you. If you'll come to me with God, nothing shall be impossible what's impossible for you today I mean what is it that as you're sitting there you're saying preacher man that's good preaching and all that and I believe that for somebody else but I've got a situation that is literally impossible there is no hope there is no way may I say to you today with God nothing shall be impossible you keep praying because God's going to remember You keep believing because God keeps His promises. And I'm telling you today, God has not forgotten you. And there came a day in the life of Elizabeth and in the life of Zacharias where they have their child, they have their baby, and everyone's gathered around. And they say, go ahead, name him Zacharias. Name him after his daddy. And Zacharias says, he's not able to say anything. And they say, yeah, name him Zacharias. Name him God remembers. And he says, And finally they get the message and they bring him a tablet and he writes down on that tablet, his name is John. And you say, what does the name John mean? Jehovah shows favor. 
put it in our, in our language, put it in our vernacular. God remembers, God keeps His promises, and God is gracious. I say, preacher, I don't even know if I'm worthy to pray this prayer. I'll go ahead and tell you, you're not. Preacher, I don't even know if I'm worthy to receive this blessing from the Lord. I'll go ahead and tell you, you're not. But as you stand in Christ Jesus, as you stand blessed and beloved of God, you can pray whatsoever you will in the will of your heavenly Father. And the Word of God says, it shall be done unto you. Boy, there's big news. Somebody got saved. That's wonderful. There's big news. Somebody believed on Jesus and was baptized. That's wonderful. But here's the best news. With God, nothing shall be impossible. He can save a child who just comes with an open heart and says, God, I believe you. He can save an old man who with his dying breath says, God, I'm sorry, but I'm trusting you. He can save anybody. He can forgive anybody. Because with God, nothing shall be impossible. What's impossible for you today? It's not impossible with God. If I were to come to you today and you were to describe your situation, I would say, it's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. God's going to do it. And you were to laugh at me, you'd be in good company. God told Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a baby. And she said, am I going to have a baby in my old age? Is my husband going to have a, a child sitting on his lap calling him dad when he should be calling him grandpa? Are you kidding me? And she laughed. But then the Lord said, it's going to come to pass. And I'm going to have the last laugh in this. And then we see Sarah holding a child in her arms in her old age. It's not all about children. It's not all about babies. It's all about this. God can do anything. He can do anything but fail. And He can do anything for you if you'll just believe Him and you'll just ask Him. Heavenly Father.